the way in which patients are gonna encounter their surgeon at the time of a diagnosis of lung cancer is evolving. It used to be that patients would get a nodule identified on some imaging and then they get sent to the pulmonologist maybe and then the surgeon. But nowadays, people come from all different varieties. You can have patients referred from primary care, you can have patients referred in directly from medical oncology, um, you can have patients referred from pulmonary. Um, you can even have patients self-referred, honestly. So you're kind of going to be dealing with a, a heterogeneity of, of sources for, for patients being referred into you. But then once they see you, um, then it gets real, you know, because oftentimes the patients come in pretty primed, um, they're seeing a surgeon, the expectation is they're going to have surgery. Um, and so you're really the shepherd to kind of take the baton and continue them on their treatment journey, which by and large today includes more than just the surgeon. The MDT, or Multidisciplinary Tumor Board, really has a pretty critical role nowadays. I mean, it was already an important um, aspect of care that we provide to patients, but I think it's, it's taken on an even larger role now, given the fact that patients, that the whole landscape for lung cancer care has uh, gotten way more complicated, and it's a way to very um, succinctly uh, and efficiently pull in opinions and um, resources from all the disciplines involved in treating these patients in a very, um, a very coordinated way. It can save time in terms of the care coordination that otherwise would be happening asynchronously with emails, text, phone calls, and that sort of thing, um, but still gives the patient the benefit of sort of harnessing all the collective knowledge of the thoracic oncology team. At our institution, we don't necessarily present every patient at tumor board, that would be um, overwhelming, but we do present all the complicated cases. There's certain cases where the histology or the, the tumor type itself is um, rare enough that all cases get presented, like for mesothelioma, for instance. Um, that's just one example. Early stage patients, for instance, are being presented a lot more commonly in tumor board, so patients with stage 1B or 2, uh, which heretofore really had not been done consistently. But again, it's a very efficient way to get all of our specialty providers involved and engaged in the decision-making process for any given patient. So diagnosis and staging winds up being more heavily um, weighted towards pulmonary. For instance, we have a very robust uh, interventional pulmonary team who does a whole lot of diagnostics as well as the radiologists who are going to kind of tell us what their level of index of suspicion is for a given lesion. Um, so I would say on the front end it winds up being dominated by pulmonary, radiology, and surgery for those direct referrals that we see patients who have nodules identified with lung cancer screening protocols. When it gets into the staging once we've actually established a diagnosis then now we've gotten more oncologists involved, uh, genetic testing, all of that sort of thing. There's lots of overlap in terms of who's responsible for doing the staging uh, and completing that workup. You've got patients that will come to see you who have a complete package. They've had a PET, they've had PFTs, they've had uh, molecular um, profiling done, and then you have patients that have simply a nodule on a CT scan. So the surgeon has to absolutely be ready to take the bull by the horns and, and guide and lead that process of establishing diagnosis and staging. With regards to the role that the surgeon plays in molecular testing, I'd say it's still an evolution. By and large, it's really sat within the realm of medical oncology uh, and pathology uh, because the medical oncologists are the ones who are going to be giving the chemotherapeutics or immunotherapies, etc., based upon the molecular testing. They definitely have multiple legs up on surgeons, honestly, as they should with regards to having their finger on the pulse of what's going on with the newest late-breaking clinical trials data. Um, the surgeons have historically lagged behind in that sense, but definitely we need to do a better job of educating ourselves so that we can provide the best care for our patients. Particularly, if we're seeing a patient who doesn't have an oncologist, who's never seen an oncologist, we need to be the ones to be able to understand the landscape and get the genetic testing done, refer them to oncology as needed, and, and spearhead that process. So the role of biomarkers is uh, critically important and gaining in importance even uh, as we speak. Um, patients will come to you 
often, depending upon your, your practice setting, uh, with some information. You've got a lot of direct-to-patient marketing that's out there and patients will come in asking for a particular immunotherapy by name even. So you've got to be ready as a surgeon or as the frontline person who's going to be interacting with that patient to have an intelligent conversation with them. If you have a patient who doesn't bring it up, then you need to also then be ready to bring it up and let them know, hey, these are some things that are out there and I need to make sure that we get all the full genetic profiling done testing, et cetera, to figure out what's the, gonna be the appropriate treatment for you. But I definitely think that that conversation needs to be had up front. The other benefit of having that conversation early on is the fact that it um, prepares the patient for the fact that they may need to have additional um, treatments recommended for them either before surgery or down the road and it winds up being a huge benefit to having surgery particularly when you have patients who are um, faced with the decision of whether or not they want to have radiation therapy uh, as opposed to stereotactic radiation therapy for instance for an early stage tumor as opposed to surgery which way should they go? Well, one of the huge benefits of surgery is A, we get lymph nodes, which gives an incredible amount of information regarding staging, but then we also have the entire tumor. We can check for um, treatment effects, et cetera, um, and get updated genetic information about that tumor that's gonna guide treatment. I do think that it's important to have a, um, at least a rudimentary understanding from the surgeon's standpoint of the um, most common genetic tests that should be done for every patient, like PDL1, um, ALK, and ROS, uh, and EGFR. So every surgeon should be somewhat familiar with those and figure out the ways in which they need to obtain that testing at their given institution because it is a little bit all over the map in terms of how long the testing takes, etc. insurance issues, um, whether or not the patient comes in with a biopsy or if you're going to be the one that's providing the tissue for that diagnosis such that you need to know how to order the test. Um, you need to be in communication with your pathologist, what's the turnaround time, etc. So we do need to be informed. How do we assure seamless referrals and communications between oncologists and surgeons uh, and pulmonologists and radiologists and pathologists I think is really tricky. A lot of ways it's somewhat institution dependent or region dependent in terms of how patients are coming to you. Um, and obviously we have new and um, improved ways of communicating with one another. But I think if you're talking internal versus external, that winds up being tricky. Internal, it is very seamless. At Stanford, we have every day our clinics are staffed by multiple oncologists and at least one surgeon. So that interaction really is pretty seamless. We talk about patients in between other patients. It's very easy. We try to coordinate their visits such that they're seeing both of us on the same day. Uh, when it's external, that's a little bit trickier. But the benefit of nurturing and cultivating those external referrals and whatnot is really critical, not just because they're gonna send you more patients, but because it's gonna make for better care for the patient. So you're gonna wind up having to use texts and emails and things like that. Just picking up the phone and calling people honestly saves a ton of headache down the road. The changing landscape of treatment um, has definitely changed the way that we talk to our patients about the expectations for treatment. And so what I tell them up front is that we're going on a journey and it's my job to help shepherd you through that process. We can make left-hand turns, right turns, U-turns, etc. cetera, um, but I'll keep you abreast of all the information along the way, but just know that we're gonna be gathering data and each step of the way, we may make a change based upon new information that we gather. Again, one of the benefits of having surgery is the fact that we get innumerable additional data points on a patient, whether they've had induction therapy first and then they've had surgery and we're looking at treatment effects, etc., cetera, um, or they're getting adjuvant therapy after surgery and I need to continue to coordinate with oncologists. So letting the patient know that this is not a one and done thing is I think incredibly important. As I mentioned, patients are gonna to come to you and they'll be primed and ready to go. They're seeing the surgeon, the expectation is they're gonna have surgery. And so sometimes when you wanna pump the brakes a little bit and say, well, just a second, actually, your tumor is a lot larger than the earliest stage cancer. Because of that, or because of its location, or because we think there's a little lymph node involved, I'm gonna recommend for you to have induction therapy first. That can be a bitter pill to swallow, and so you need to actually prep them. And even if that wasn't the conversation you had up front, I tell patients, 
okay, you don't need to have induction. We're gonna go ahead and go straight to surgery, but we need to still have a conversation up front about the fact that I'm gonna get a lot more information after surgery that's gonna help me to determine whether or not you need additional treatment. If you prep them for it, then it's not quite so jarring, right? So that when they come back to see me post-op and we're going over their pathology, I can say, yeah, this is uh, one of the things that we talked about. So I'm really gonna need you to see my colleague, Dr. X, and they're gonna continue to you know, uh, have conversations with you about adding on some chemotherapy or immunotherapy, which is gonna help you to um, you know, have a better outcome long-term. If you don't do that conversation uh, early and often, then it can be jarring, and then you wind up having a lot of attrition, whereas a patient may just say, no, nope, this is not what I signed up for. I thought I was just having surgery, I'm done. And then they've been shortchanged significantly. With regards to the question of kind of how do I use immunotherapy um, in my practice and whether or not I have engaged oncologists in that decision making, absolutely. Uh, the oncologist is, is critical and pivotal because they're A, going to be the ones that are going to be administering the the, um, the treatment, um, but B, I need that I need their expertise in the, in the decision making process. Which patients that I, do I wind up referring or do I um, see are patients who have uh, stage two or higher disease. So basically large tumors, any nodal involvement, or a tumor that's marginally resectable, those are the patients that it's a very easy conversation to have to say, hey, I think that we should consider neoadjuvant therapy for you. Um, so I usually have that conversation up front with patients. I can't say that they all accept it because it's really kind of all over the map, but at least I've given them the opportunity uh, and I try to encourage them to at least have a conversation with my oncology colleagues. All of the um, either neoadjuvant or adjuvant IO trials really have demonstrated tremendous benefits, leaps and bounds above any sort of traditional chemotherapy regimens that we're able to offer patients. The benefit is there, I'd say it's pretty proven and not really disputed a ton. The main question is, what's the cost? <laughs> you know, what's the surgical cost specifically when you're talking about neoadjuvant therapy? And that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I'd say most of the data that we have are sparse, but the data that we do have are pretty reassuring. A, um, you still have about a 20% attrition rate. So about 20% of patients are not going to have surgery. And we still don't really fully understand what's happening with that 20%. That's my main take home message is what's going on with the 20% with these 20% marginal folks who are not really going to probably be surgical candidates anyway, or were there people who are fully resectable up front and we didn't resect them uh, at the time and now they're have a missed opportunity. Or are these 20% really representing people who had progression of their disease and we probably shouldn't have been operating on them? I don't think we have that fully elucidated yet. But I do think that we're able to say from a safety and technical aspects of the surgery that there's reasonable evidence that it is safe to do, although we need more data.